Um, welcome everyone to uh, today's talk about identifying bees. I'm glad you could join us today. Uh, before we get started with our guest speaker, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Phil Harberger Park Conservancy. We are a donation-based nonprofit that bridges the gap between San Antonio and nature by providing programs free to the public. Uh, we also protect the natural habitat of the park through advocacy, fundraising, and promotion. Um, if you enjoy the programs that we offer, please consider donating or becoming a member. Um, you can learn more by visiting our website at philharbergerpark.org. And um, I want a couple of housekeeping things. Today our talk will be recorded, so we ask that everybody turn off your video and turn off your microphones. Um, and if you have a question, you can um, type the question in the chat, and at the end of the talk we will answer as many questions as possible. So today we have AJ, Tal uh, AJ and Al um, oh sorry AJ and Annie Talamantes here to speak with us about bees. Uh, AJ is a master naturalist and a third year beekeeper, and Annie is in the process of getting her master beekeeper certification. AJ and Annie, the floor is yours. All right. Thank, thank you, you, Teresa. Uh, let me start with a few items. I just want to thank Drake at the Butterfly Learning Center for the invitation. Uh, I'd like to thank Teresa at Hartberger for really with the technical part of this and kind of getting this all set up for us. Um, and I'd really like to thank everybody in attendance and uh, appreciate you guys spending a little bit of your uh, Saturday morning with us. Um, I'm AJ Talamantes and uh, like Teresa said, I'm a Texas Master Naturalist. I actually just completed the course and my wife is Annie Talamantes and she's, uh, and she's a Texas Master Beekeeper in training. And together we've been raising bees for three years. So this is new to us, but uh, we're definitely learning and uh, we've learned a lot about honeybees and we're gonna learn a lot about native bees today. Um, Annie's going to step out here for a second and she'll be back towards uh, towards the end when we talk a little bit more about honeybees. So with that being said, I guess let's get going, guys. So these are going to be the major topics that we'll be looking at today. We're going to talk about bee basics because I really don't know kind of where everyone's at when it comes to like your bee knowledge. So we'll kind of start with the beginning and the early stuff and kind of the easier stuff and then we'll move up from there. Um, with bee basics, we'll talk a little bit about bee anatomy, kind of different features of a bee. Um, we'll also move on our way to uh, native bees and we'll, I'll give you kind of a list of some of the most common bees that you would see uh, and just kind of characteristics on how to identify them. After that, uh, my wife will come back in here and she'll talk a little bit about bee basics, honeybee basics, and kind of show you a little bit of what goes on inside a honeybee hive and kind of all the jobs that these workers have uh, inside the hive. And at the end, we'll talk a little bit about how we can attract bees to your yard or to your garden and kind of how we can make habitats for them that uh, that they'll really appreciate. So with that being said, let's get into bee basics. So I think a good place to start for us today is kind of ask yourself, when you see these insects out, you, you can ask is like, is this actually a bee? Um, there are, it's easy to get confused. It's easy to maybe kind of think like, well, you know what, that looks like a bee, but it kind of also looks like a wasp and it kind of also maybe even might look like a fly. So we'll kind of look at how we can uh, determine the difference. Um, again, we'll talk very basic bee anatomy because we'll be talking a lot about how the different parts of a bee and we'll kind of give you the basics on that. And uh, with this first part, we'll also kind of introduce to you guys how we have solitary bees, but we also have social bees and we'll show you the differences between those two. Now, I wanted to start off with this video because uh, I actually took this video out on a, a property and I saw this and I told my wife, I was like, hey, this, this is gonna be perfect. Like I'll take a quick video of this bee. Uh, we'll go we'll use our, our guides and we'll identify it, but uh, it's not a bee. So I'm gonna give, I'm gonna let you guys take a look at it and just kind of see all the behavior and what it's doing and see if you can determine whether this is a mud dauber wasp or paper wasp or a hoverfly. I've kind of given away the answer, it's not a bee. But uh, let me get this video going for you guys. So when I originally saw it, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is like this bees on a flower or this uh, insects on a flower, it's gotta be a bee. Um, it's kind of got the classic bee colors. It's, it's moving around and even does something with its abdomen that we're, we're accustomed to seeing with honeybees. But again, you have to kind of wonder like, is this a bee? Cause it is missing some part of, uh, of, of a bee's uh, typical anatomy. And I'll let it kind of play here for a little bit so you can kind of see what I'm talking about, especially towards the back end where you see that abdomen dip a little bit as it's feeding on some nectar. But as you see the bee or the insect, as you see the insect turn, you start seeing, okay, this looks a little different. This is not your typical bee type of setup. And there's a big giveaway uh, that kind of tells you like, hey, this is not what I thought it was. This is not a bee. 
So zooming in, you can see that one of the, the big indicators here is that even though it's on a flower, I mean, many things pollinate flowers, um, it's not necessarily a bee. And my biggest indicator was the antennae. Um, it's a little bit different. It's obviously not a mud dauber, right? It doesn't have that kind of skinny body. It's obviously not a paper wasp with the same thing, kind of doesn't have that skinny body or a yellow jacket. In, in reality, this is actually a hoverfly. And the way I was able to identify that it was a hoverfly is I used a couple of tools, but the big giveaway was really the antennae right here. And with that being said, we can talk a little bit about the difference between a bee and a wasp. Um, with bees, you're gonna see a thicker body. Um, you can see how this one's a little chunkier as opposed to a wasp who's kind of on the, on the skinny body, kind of narrow waist side. Um, bees, for the most part, they're often hairy. Some are more hairy than others, but for the most part, they're gonna have some hair and that hair, of course, helps them collect pollen. Uh, wasps, generally hairless, very different looking, um, just not as hairy as you see a, a bee. And again, uh, I mentioned pollen collecting hairs. You'll see that on a bee, whether it's on the legs and sometimes even on the belly, and you don't see it so much on a wasp. Uh, legs are another big indicator. You can see how this uh, bee has kind of stout legs, and she's got stout legs kind of all the way around, whereas this, as uh, you see the wasp, who have a uh, little skinny, kind of spindly legs, and they just aren't as, uh, as buff, I guess you could say, as a bee. Now, what we saw was actually a hoverfly, and like I mentioned before, that was the big indicator for me was that antennae. Uh, bees will typically have a long antennae, and it's kind of elbow shape. Um, a flies are going to be a little bit shorter, and you can see here the difference. Um, another big indicator will be whether this is a bee or whether this is a fly, is that bees are going to have four wings, as opposed to a fly that's only going to have two. Uh, and I try to get a good view here, and you can see this lower uh, wing right here, and then the upper wing right here. Um, also, bees are going to have a distinct thorax and abdomen, and you'll see how they're very clear cut, as opposed to a fly who's kind of like mashed up. They still have the abdomen and the thorax, but it's kind of mashed up and kind of all runs together. And it's a thicker waist, I guess you could say. Uh, bees, of course, are going to have eyes on the side of their head, like this one, whereas uh, a fly, it's going to be more on the front. And if I can jump back to this one, you can see how uh, this uh, her eyes are much more on the front as opposed to the side. Now, today's really anatomy, we're gonna keep it simple, but these are terms you'll hear quite a bit. Um, we'll be talking about the head. Obviously, the head is gonna be at the front. Uh, the thorax, which is your center. Uh, we'll talk a lot about the abdomen, which is uh, towards the back. The antennae, because that is a, it's a big uh, role in uh, helping identify bees. And we'll also talk about pollen carrying hairs because bees are hairy little insects. Now, we're also gonna look at the difference between a social bee and a solitary bee. This is the great pick that we got off, uh, I think it was a Texas Parks and Wildlife uh, website, but this is a, a feral colony of European honeybees. And you can see that these bees are numerous. Um, they're all working together. They're all helping each other out. And as we get closer to the, the, the discussion about honeybees, you'll see how all of these bees in here actually have different roles and how they help the, the queen in different ways. Now, this is a, a social bee, highly social uh, a bee, and this might be what a solitary bee might look like. Um, interesting fact on bees is that 90% of the, the bees here in Texas are actually solitary. Um, so more, the majority of the bees that you may see in your garden, if it is native bee, it's, it's, it's gonna be a solitary bee. I wanna say this is probably some type of digger that's uh, taking up residence down there. Now, within uh, solitary bees, there's even different types of nests. Um, you're gonna see a true solitary bee, like a leaf cutter, and we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, and that's gonna typically have, uh, that nest will typically contain like a single mated female who raises her brood in her nest. So essentially she's doing it all in that little solitary cavity. Uh, but we also, uh, in the solitary bee world, we also have communal uh, bee nests, and this is going to be something kind of like the, the, your diggers that you see. You'll see where you have many mated females, but each of them have their own nests. Uh, I like to kind of say, like, this is kind of like an apartment complex almost, in that everybody has their own spot, but, uh, they're, but they're all distinct and, and separate 
from one another. Uh, just to give you a quick look at what a, a solitary cavity nester might look like would be a carpenter bee. And again, carpenter bees are, uh, are native to our region. And we'll talk about uh, the characteristics and helping you identify those here in a sec. But you'll notice that carpenter bees in their solitary cavity will typically collect pollen for the nest, as you can see here, right here. She'll lay that egg on that pollen ball. And then of course that larvae grows up and feeds on that pollen ball. It eventually will pupate and then the next generation will begin. So it's fascinating to see how these solitary bees are very, are very self-sufficient and they can kind of get everything done in their, in their little cavity, whereas a social bee is a little different. Uh, let me quick look at another uh, solitary type of nest. Um, whereas this one's in a solitary cavity, this one's gonna be more of a solitary ground nester. Uh, and then this is just a typical longhorn bee nest uh, where you can see that little bit of mound of dirt. And these are the ones you'll see kind of like in your garden pathways or kind of just like open areas, on, uh, maybe in your yard where you don't necessarily have any turf. Uh, you'll see these little holes pop up but the idea is very similar as far as how she's gonna be reproducing. She's still gonna collect pollen for her nest. She's still gonna lay an egg on a pollen ball and the larvae is still gonna feed on it. And, uh, and again, it'll pupate and the next generation will begin. Now, there's different kinds of social bees as, as well. Um, there's your semi-social, which is like your bumblebee, uh, where you have a mated female, she makes her nest, she forages, she overwinters, uh, and I'm sorry, she produces worker daughters, who help rear her brood and she uh, and the cycle begins all over again. So there are workers like a honeybee nest, but just not as many. Uh, the, the population is going to be uh, small compared to a honeybee, a honeybee nest. And that, of course, leads us here to the honeybees who are highly social. Um, a mated queen, basically her job is to produce eggs. And you can see just how that works here. Uh, she'll lay her egg, the larvae begins, and it's growing. And the entire time, workers are going to be feeding her, take, taking care of all her needs, doing everything for her. Uh, and that includes foraging and tending to young, all sorts of jobs that these honeybees have inside the nest. But very, very different looking uh, setups. But at the end of the day, they're all still bees, and all of these bees definitely are in our area. Now, that leads us to the native bees. Um, we want to look a little bit about native bee numbers. Uh, we'll talk about uh, identifying characteristics, um, really like the shape of a bee, uh, the shape, uh, uh, the size of one, uh, maybe even like the behavior, uh, just all different kind of characteristics that'll help you identify. Uh, and then we'll go through a good list of common Texas bees. And I wanted to kind of start with bees that are more, that you're more likely to see uh, as opposed to like, you know, you'll probably never see that bee or it's gonna be difficult to see that one just because they're just not abundant in our area. So the bee that we, oh, let me get to bee numbers first. Um, we have over 20,000 native bees around the world and that's just, and it's a huge number. And that's sometimes what makes uh, identifying bees difficult. Um, out of those 20,000 that we have around the world, 4,000 of them are in uh, North America and then 800 of these are here in Texas. So you can see that it's very diverse and there's many kinds of uh, native bees that we have here in Texas with us. Um, I will quickly go through this, but I think it's, in, it's important to know um, we have six bee families here in Texas and they all kind of have different characteristics. Uh, the majority of the bees that we'll see today are the apity uh, family and that's going to be your bumblebees, your carpenter bees, your longhorn bees, and your honeybees. And a quick uh, note on that is Remember that honeybees are not native here to Texas. They're actually brought over from Europe and they're not native to our area. Um, you'll, we'll also look really quickly at the calidity, which are your plaster bees. And we'll talk a little bit more about all the kind of different uh, characteristics that they have because they're kind of neat bees. Uh, the andrinity, the minor bees, and those are your diggers, of course. Uh, the halictidae, which are your sweat bees. And I don't know, maybe you've been out in the backyard one day at a barbecue or something and something kind of lands on you and it's not necessarily a fly. It might have been a sweat bee, uh, just kind of uh, sipping on that salt that your sweat is producing. Uh, Amylidae, which are oil collecting bees, we won't talk too much about those. And the uh, megakilidae are your leaf cutter bees, which are just cool, really, really neat bees. Now, a couple of other things here on the families. Um, your apity, like I mentioned before, your bumblebees, your carpenters, um, they're your most recognizable bees. Um, extremely hairy, uh, very, very kind of robust kind of bees. 
big bees, um, yeah, just like a, like a carpenter bee or, or a bumblebee, these are just larger bees. Uh, you have plaster bees. Kind of a neat thing about some of these guys uh, is that they actually, they're called plaster bees because they apply like a glue lining to the walls of their nest and it kind of seals it and it kind of helps protect any, uh, any larvae inside there. But these again are also generally hairy bees. Um, your minor bees, which is the largest of the family are just ground nesters with the name implies the adrenity. The minor bees are, are gonna be digging those holes. Uh, the Helictidae, which are your sweat bees, um, are common backyard bees. Uh, you'll see these quite a bit. We actually saw one yesterday, and we'll show you a little bit of video. Um, they vary in shape and color, and they're widespread. So odds are some of the bees that you do see in your backyard that are uh, native are, are maybe Helictidae, in the Helictidae family. Uh, Molidity are your oil collectors. I'm not going to talk, like I said, too much about these guys, but just, just to know, it's really the oldest known bee fossil is a Molidity type of bee, um, the least diverse family. And uh, from our research, they basically just kind of say that these are small, unassuming bees, so these bees don't get the love. Maybe uh, the bumblebees do. Uh, your megachility, uh, leaf cutter bees, and that those are just cool looking bees. I mean, you see one in flight, how it's carrying that leaf that it just kind of got uh, maybe, maybe kind of cut off a piece of rose. It's really, really neat to see them in flight. Um, they carry that pollen on their underside where a honeybee might uh, kind of carry it on their legs. Diverse family. And I'll show you kind of ways to help you remember um, what is, who is who, because leaf cutters are a little bit more kind of uh, like submarine or cigar shaped uh, uh, as they kind of, as you, as you see them in comparison to other bees. Now, native bees are diverse. Um, there's going to be a lot of similarities between them, but there's also going to be a lot of differences. Uh, the characteristics we're going to look at are going to be size. So is this like a large bee? Is it a smaller bee? Um, we'll look at shape. Is this kind of a robust, chunky bee, or is it more of a skinny bee, kind of a slender bee? Uh, we'll look at color. Some bees uh, are metallic in color, metallic green, metallic blues, and some are just good old-fashioned black and yellow. It just depends. Uh, hair. Um, you'll see that some bees are super hairy, like your bumblebees, and then you might see some bees, like your sweat bees, who just really don't have much hair. So those, uh, we'll look at the, the differences there as well. We'll look at behavior, uh, it's kind of specifically their flying behavior because that kind of helps us identify the bees. Uh, you'll see some bees are like quick darting type of bees. And then you'll see bees like a honeybee who is a little more methodical as, as it's making its way with flowers. And then again, like kind of we mentioned already, the nesting because all of these bees do, uh, do have different types of nest. Um, it just depends on the bee itself. Now, uh, full disclosure, identifying bees can be difficult. So my biggest advice for, for you guys as you guys get out in your garden and uh, start looking around and, and uh, seeing if we can uh, identify them is just know that bees are fast, they're small, and they're diverse. It's different from birding because I'm, I'm a big fan of birding as well, but because they're just so small and they are harder to, to kind of identify. But if you're in a good garden, you're in a good area where, where they're pollinating, you'll, you'll have multiple uh, shots of trying to capture one. Uh, my advice to you guys really is to use reputable guides and websites for your region specifically. That's huge. Um, as you get online and you uh, start doing your research, finding a guide maybe like from the United Kingdom doesn't necessarily help me here in Central Texas. So finding things that are here for Central Texas is really going to be your best bet. Uh, mnemonic devices work for me. Uh, and I'll show you my little kind of silly kind of goofy tricks that I do to kind of uh, help me understand or help me really remember what this bee is that I'm, I might be uh, identifying. And, it, and we did it yesterday and it worked out great. It's just kind of, it's kind of interesting that these mnemonic devices really kind of help you kind of figure out who's who. Um, smartphone, of course, take your pictures, your video, and we'll show you a little bit of video that we've captured ourselves. And I saw an app, it was like a BID app, but at the same time it was not working. So there might be something up with that. Um, the iNaturalist app would work just as well. So that might be something you guys might be uh, uh, interested in. It'll just kind of taking a quick picture of that and sending it out to the greater community. And they, kinda, they definitely help you uh, identify what you saw. In fact, I believe I used that with uh, the hoverfly that we were talking about earlier. I was able to get a good shot of it, send it out to the iNaturalist community and uh, quickly got some hits back and said, hey, that's a hoverfly that you had there. Now, um, this is a great example of one of the guides that I, I really use. And this is actually going to be how we talk about these bees. 
Um, these are going to be the most common. You can see your bumblebee up top. Uh, you can barely see this little sweat bee right here. You can see your longhorn right here. Obviously, you can see why they're called longhorn. Uh, your large carpenter bee here, your green sweat one, which we saw one yesterday, really cool down here, and your leaf cutter. So these are going to be the ones that we, you'll see more likely when you're out and about. That doesn't mean to say you won't see others, but odds are the one that's going to be in your backyard is going to be right here. And I left a link here, and we'll be sharing all these slides with you guys. I left a link here just to, so to get you back to some reputable uh, local uh, resources that you can use uh, to, uh, to find the bees that you're looking for. Um, you can print these out. These are all in PDF uh, in format. So this is, this is something that you could actually uh, print yourself out and uh, get out there and, and uh, take it out there and see what you guys can find. Uh, a couple other resources that I really like are, and again, from the uh, University of Texas. Again, we're looking at reputable sources. We're looking at local sources. And you can see how these kind of help you identify who's who in the Texas native bee world. And you can see another one that uh, we've used quite a bit. And these are the kind of ones you see like at HEB who maybe kind of breaks down your local birds or your local snakes. It's the same kind of setup with, with bees. And what I do like about here, uh, this one specifically, is that they're kind of showing you characteristics to look for specifically like, hey, you saw metallic hairy belly bees. Maybe it, it's probably a mason. And then you can kind of go from there. Or, hey, the bee you saw had hairy legs. Well, more than likely it's a digger, miner, chimney. And then you can kind of, kind of narrow it down from there. And just the last a few looks at some of these guides that are really, really just beneficial. So let's start with the, the bumblebees uh, from the Apity family. Um, I think we're all pretty familiar with bumblebees. Uh, they're medium to very large. It really just depends on, on the type. Um, the shape's going to be robust. It's, it's a big, chunky bee. It's almost uh, like I heard it say, uh, said once, it's like, I can't believe this thing's even flying because it shouldn't be able to fly because it's so big. Um, but they do, right? Uh, and again, the color's going to be black and yellow band, your classic bee color, and super hairy. The hair is all over this bee, and of course, she's using that to collect pollen. Um, how I remember this bee, I just think of big bee, uh, bee bee, bumblebee. Um, I, my brain's always I'm just going to go to the, to the fact that this is probably the biggest bee that I'll see out there. It does kind of have a bumbling nature, maybe because of its size, and it is kind of a classic black and yellow. So bumblebees, I, I think they're one of the easier ones to identify. It's like, kind of like, hey, that's a cardinal. I can identify a cardinal. Um, we, should, uh, we should be able to identify the bumblebees because they are those big bumbling bees. Now, other items about them, they're, nest they're, ground, uh, they're ground nesters. They're actually semi-social. So that means that they'll have a few workers uh, and uh, they do have a queen, but they're not going to be like generation after generation, like constantly like a honeybee. Um, they do, they, they do uh, the queen does overwinter. Um, so you don't have like these giant populations like you do with, uh, with the 50,000 count uh, of uh, honeybee hive. Now, behavior, these are the ones that make quite a bit of sound. They buzz when they fly and like they're large and in charge. You know they're here. Um, kind of a fun fact, they often kind of shake flowers to release pollen. I'm not 100% if they're doing that on purpose or that just happens because they're strong bees, um, but they also use scent markings to detect and avoid flowers. So they're definitely kind of communicating with one another and they do prefer large flowers. And let me get this quick video for you guys. So you can just kind of see one in action uh, if you haven't before. Uh, you can see she's actually already got pollen on her, on her legs there, but she's methodical. She's kind of looking with a, with a purpose. Uh, again, this is a larger flower. She, she's, not, she's not messing around. You gotta love the bumblebees. So that leads us to probably another very common bee that you'll come across. And that, these are your tiny sweat bees from the Helicity family. Um, these are tiny, they're small, they're medium. Yesterday, we uh, spent some time at Hardberger Park and uh, we were uh, hanging out at the demonstration garden for a few minutes. And we weren't 100% sure if we had seen a tiny sweat bee but, but if it, man, it really did look like one. Uh, I'll see if I can show you that towards the end of a presentation. But these are small, they're slender, um, their colors are gonna be kind of dark to shiny metallic, um, and some have the abdominal stripes. And you can see how that brush of hair on the hind legs that she has for her pollen. And the way I remember a sweat bee, so if I see one out and about, and I think to myself, is that a sweat bee? 
these are little guys that like sweat. So um, if, like I mentioned before, if you're in that backyard, uh, that backyard party and, and something lands on you and it's kind of enjoying it, it's not really going anywhere, there's a chance it's a sweat bean. I'll show you a video here of what that might look like. Um, let me let, let's play this really quick too. This isn't necessarily their nest, but uh, in this video, this, uh, this lady mentioned something, and I think it's important. It's something we'll talk a little bit more towards the end of the presentation, but just kind of the importance of, of planting native plants to bring some of these native bees back. Um, as far as nesting is concerned, they are solitary and they are ground nesters. Um, they do prefer bare ground and they don't like mulch. Sometimes we mulch everything left and right, but uh, these bees do not, do not like it. So if you're trying to bring some in, leaving that bare ground, just natural bare ground, is, uh, your odds are gonna increase. Let me, and let me play this video, guys. You can really see how small it is. The bee is actually right here. And if you can listen to the, to the lady speaking, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about, the, about the importance of native plants. Plants, which is obviously why these little bees decided to make a home here. So this one just landed at the base of that. You can see her tiny see right there. The legs of this little Lassia blossom. So we are so thrilled, y'all. I mean, we are really starting to see some populations of native bees here in us because we are getting the right plants out there. So inspiration. And she nailed it. It's those plants that, that they're returning uh, to their to their area and it's bringing those bees back. Now I'm gonna move a little quicker because I wanna make sure that we get to all the bees, but just a quick uh, a view of what a bee, a tiny sweat bee looks like as it's moving around. It's fast, it's jagged, it's kind of all over the place. And again, like I mentioned before, they do lick sweat for salt. Um, they can sting. I'd say most, mostly all of these bees can sting, um, but they're unlikely to sting because they really don't want anything to do with you. Um, they're after the pollen, they're after the nectar, uh, but that doesn't mean that if they're not in a situation, maybe they feel threatened, that they're not gonna sting. But for the most part, all of these can. There, there may be a few that cannot, uh, but they're not gonna sting you if they're not threatened. And of course, it being a small bee, it's gonna like smaller flowers. Let me just show you a little bit of the video just to kind of show you how it's just kind of hanging out, doing its thing, not a care in the world. And again, it's not stinging this person. Uh, it's, it's just after that, after that salt. Now, longhorn bees, another very popular bee in the area. Um, these come in all different shapes, uh, sizes, I'm sorry. Um, the shape's gonna be a little bit more robust. I would say this is a little bit bigger than a honeybee, just a little bit uh, striped abdomen short, dense, velvety brush on the legs. So these are hairy leg bees. That's a great way to, to, to identify these uh, other than the fact that they do have those long horns. Um, how I remember it, this is my cheesy mnemonic device. Um, a lot of different ones, we, there's digger bees, there's minor bees, there are longhorn bees. In my head, these are just tough names, right? That digger bee, that minor bee, that longhorn bee. So in my head, I kind of come up with the image of a hairy, tough, burly bee. And that kind of helps me remember uh, if I see a bee with a little bit of hair on the leg, it's like, wow, that's one of those tough, or maybe longhorn bees or a digger bee. It just depends on, on, on the bee itself. But that's, that's my, uh, my mnemonic device on how to remember the longhorn bee. Uh, nesting, solitary to communal. So kind of like I mentioned before, that little apartment set up where a whole bunch of these will have the same type of uh, nest all in the same area. And the behaviors, they, they move fast. And I, this is a really neat video just because you can see how they kind of hover and they can kind of move about. Um, kind of fun fact on these, the longhorns, only the males have longhorns. Um, again, they have that hairy leg. Uh, the sunflower family is really what they prefer. Really, really neat. And I, all want, I want to do more research on this, but the males sleep outside and sometimes you can even actually find them under a plant where there's multiple males all sleeping outside. Uh, of the nest. So let me show you this quick video to show you just kind of the movement. You can see them hovering around. It's almost UFO-like in the way they uh, kind of conduct themselves. Really, really, really neat. Now, pardon me, I just want to move our pace along just because we do have a couple other things that we want to share with you. Um, this is your large carpenter bee, uh, also part of the Apity family. Again, these are the ones that you're more likely to see in your uh, in your garden or in your uh, 
your backyard. These are very large. These are much like a bumblebee, but there is a huge difference. Um, they're very robust. They're shiny. They're dark blue abdomen, and that's what you see right here. And with that little bit of brush of hair on its thorax. The way I remember this, and I, and I took this from uh, Miss Molly Keck, an entomologist that we have here in San Antonio, uh, shiny hiney. I think that's the easiest way to remember this. And again, in my mono, uh, mono, mnemonic device, it's shiny like a hammer. So hammer, carpenter, it works for me as far as helping me remember who's who. Now, these, they are a solitary nester. And the cool thing is obviously that they'll chew this wood up and then use it to line the inside of the nest and you can see the pollen right there and, and just the different stages that it's going through. Uh, behavior, they can be territorial. Males will get in your face a little bit. And again, like I mentioned before, that they, they, they can sting. It's just unlikely uh, unless, unless you do something that really, really just kind of angers me. Um, fun fact, again, they reuse wood to build those cells. Um, really, really neat fact. Sometimes they call it stealing, but they'll bite the base of a flower to get to that nectar first. So they're really, really uh, smart about, I'll get to that nectar before anybody else does if I go at the base of the flower. And of course, they're gonna like large flowers. And I'll show you a little bit of the video so you can get an idea of what it looks like it's moving around. You can see it's a big bee. And you can see the shiny honey on it as well. It's just kind of methodically moving around. Now, we've got large carpenter bees, but we also got small carpenter bees. Um, these are going to be tiny. They're going to be slender. Again, you're seeing the differences. Some bees are hairy, some bees are not. Um, this color is going to be more of a dark blue to green metallic. Um, they're hairless except for the hind legs. And of course, that's going to be for their pollen. Uh, they're moving jag like quickly and jaggedly. Uh, they're solitary, kind of semi-social uh, cavity nesters. And the way I remember these guys is that uh, they're tiny, shiny hammers. They're, they're hairless. They're dark, kind of like, again, like a, like a hammer would be and this will help me if I see something small moving around out in the garden, I'm thinking like that might just be a small carpenter bee. And it's like helping me narrow down my choices in terms of what I think that bee actually is. Um, green sweat bees, cool, cool, cool bees. I don't know. We actually saw one yesterday at Hardburger. Um, these are going to be medium size. They are on the slender size. The big giveaway is really the color. That metallic green is just really, really distinct. Um, they do have a little bit of hair on their hind leg, legs. And I mean, this one's an easier one to remember. I think this is like the bumblebee. Um, they're metallic green. Like that's really the, all you have to think when you see these guys. Fast flying, attracted to sweat also. Um, there you can see their nesting habit. They do like the sunflowers and they do like bare ground. And I'll show you really quick just for a little bit because we do got to get to a couple other bees. You can see that beautiful green there. It, it just shines. And we were fortunate enough yesterday to see one at the demonstration garden as well. And you can see how that body is a little longer, not like chunky like a bumblebee, or not kind of kind of full like a honeybee either. It's peaceful, you just can kind of zen out and look at these bees all day. Now that leads us. That leads us to my favorite bee, just because it's cool. I mean, I, it's just so, uh, it's active, he, he, he does stuff. It's just, I mean, they all do stuff, but there's just something about leaf cutters that are neat. Um, it's in the Megakility family. It's small to medium size, depending on which one. Um, slender to robust. Uh, I, I kind of think of this one like an elongated honeybee. Um, the color is black with silvery hairs, and you can see that there, and you can see the stripes on the abdomen as well. Um, the hair covers the entire body. And how I remember this guy, it's kind of silly, but I think of a cigar shaped bee with a hairy abdomen because they do, they actually carry the pollen on the bottom as opposed to a honeybee that has it on its legs. So I think of like, hey, I'm gonna make a cigar. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use leaves. And that's how I kind of think of a leaf cutter bee because I know that it's gonna be kind of an elongated bee. Now they are solitary cavity nesters, and of course, like, why are they picking up? Why are they cutting those leaves and using them? They're using them in their nest. And you can see how this one's done. So, um, and again, you can see the hair on the bottom or the, I believe this is pollen that she's got down here on the bottom, really, really neat. Uh, this video, just, it just blows your mind. As you see how she's cutting through um, the behavior, I see this in honeybees as well. 
uh, they'll often kind of raise their 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 abdomen, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, and again, the kind of the interesting thing about these is that they carry their pollen on the belly, the belly rather their legs. And if you ever see, maybe your roses have these like very symmetrical kind of slices in them, these cutouts. Odds are that you may be a leaf cutter that's kind of helping herself. And I'll show you this video to show you how quickly she is. She can work, and how quickly and how uh, how quickly she could actually get everything she needs. She's kind of in and out. Now, I won't spend too much time on the mason bees, but like I said, we're gonna be sharing everything here. An easy way to remember it. Um, I think of mason, I think of that letter O, because these are very round bees. They're rounded shape, as opposed to like an elongated one, like a leaf cutter, or kind of the more stout, like a bumblebee. Um, just know that if it's a rounded shape bee, like its abdomen's kind of rounded and its thorax kind of rounded, it might be a mason bee. And you can really see the shape right here. I'm going to move quickly through a few of these here, guys. And of course, it being uh, Mason B, perfect name for it, it's going to use mud to line the cells in its solitary cavity. Now, miny bees, again, I'll move quick because I do want to get to the honeybees. Um, they're tiny to large. Uh, the way I remember this, and this is another cheesy one, uh, a mining bee, I think myself like, okay, this is a miner, right? He's got to go into the earth. He's going to need a gray belt because they have that gray striped abdomen. And that's just the way I remember that if I see a gray kind of striped abdomen B, maybe that it's on the ground, there's a good chance it's gonna be a mining B. Uh, behavior, they prefer certain kind of problems. That was kind of interesting. They're not necessarily like equal opportunity. Uh, and again, they do like to find that bare soil kind of sunny place. Uh, plaster bees, this will be the last one we'll look at before we move on. Um, these are small to large. Um, silver white stripe and you can see it there the way i remember these guys if you see a bee and it's like hey i noticed that the hair's kind of flattened on the abdomen um that's going to be your plaster bee and the way i remember this one is that the hair is plastered on its abdomen and again one of those mnemonic devices anything that works just to help us uh, remember who it is or kind of help us identify who it is that we saw out there and i'm going to keep moving because i want to make sure that we get to this so this leads us back to honeybee basics. And I'm gonna welcome my wife back in here because she's gonna talk a little bit about uh, honeybees and kind of how to identify them and what you might find. Hello, um, so we'll be talking about identifying characteristics and inside of the hive for the honeybee. So just a little bit of bee history. They were introduced to the new world by Europeans in the 1600s and they are non-native. So for their size, um, the honeybee is going to be medium to large, medium being more of the worker bees, which are females, and large being the queen and the drone bee. The drone is the male bee. Um, they are about the same size, but the queen bee is going to be more um, elongated. Her abdomen will be more elongated, and the drone is just going to be more robust. He's going to be just, he's going to have a larger, more round body. Um, their color is going to be amber to black. They're going to have the stripes on the abdomen, as you can see here. And they will have fuzz on the thorax, which is this right here, under the abdomen, which they will also collect pollen under the abdomen. They'll collect it all over since they are hairy. And they have um, hair on their head and their eyes. Okay, so their behavior, they uh, buzz methodically among flowers, meaning that they will um, select a flower that they're going to forage on that day, and they will stick to the same flower. They won't go from one flower to a different flower, which I think is pretty neat. Um, they're social insects. Um, they are considered a super organism, so it's like an engine. There's a lot of working parts, and all of those working parts need to be in sync in order for it to be kind of a... It's, it's good for the whole um, social unit of the, the colony. Um, there is an egg laying queen. It can be a wild or a managed hive. Um, and we're gonna be looking at managed bees today. So we're gonna start, oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back and show you a video here. So this video, you're gonna see um, a bee that's foraging on a 
flower. I do want you to notice before I start the video, you're going to see some white pollen on the side of the legs. Those are called pollen baskets. Um, you're going to see that this is also an older bee because you'll see the wings are tattered and she is inside the flower collecting nectar. So it's just a short video. You can see the tattered wings right there. It's an older bee. You see the pollen on top of the uh, thorax and on top of the head. And then you can see the pollen on the, on the uh, hind legs there. Okay, so we're gonna go on to the next slide here. So we're gonna talk about the queen. Um, in a managed hive, queens are mated. Um, you can see the elongated body or the abdomen that I was telling you about earlier. And in wild hives, the queens will leave on mating flights, typically about three mating flights, and they will return to the hive. Um, when they are, the queen larva is fed a nutrient-rich royal jelly, and when she is a uh, full queen, she can lay up to 2,000 eggs in a day, and she can live up to three to five years. So this is a picture here. It's a frame with a, a lot of uh, worker bees, and there is a queen bee on this uh, slide. So I'm just going to give you a few seconds to see if you can point her out. The next slide, I'll, it'll be circled in red so you'll be able to see her if you can't find her. But again, her abdomen is elongated. It's a little bit darker amber in color. It might have a big, like a more of a dark circle on the thorax. So this is the next slide. It's going to show you where she's at if you haven't been able to identify her. And there she is. So now we're gonna talk about worker bees. Um, they make up the largest population in the hive. There are several thousand uh, female, all female bees, worker bees. They all have different responsibilities and specific jobs from the time that they emerge from the cell as an adult bee. And they do have a lifespan of about six weeks. So these are just some of, these are some of the duties that they um, take on in the hive. Uh, the cleaner bees, they will, they're responsible for the first few days of uh, cleaning the comb and the brood in the hive, um, as well as other cleaning responsibilities in the hive. Then there are your nurse bees that take care of the brood and they can check a single larva over a thousand times a day. Um, depending if they're rearing a new queen, the queen will get the royal jelly, whereas the worker and the drone bees will get a mixture of uh, pollen, honey, and jelly. Um, the pollen packers. So those bees are responsible for bringing in the pollen into the hive and packing it into clean cells. And that will be eventually turned into bee bread, which will feed the larva. Um, queen assistant. So this is the entourage of the queen. And they, um, they actually feed the queen, they remove her waste, and they also distribute the queen pheromone throughout the hive, which uh, lets the other bees know that they are in a queen right colony. Uh, the fanner bees, they circulate air into the hive. There's bees that will actually go get water from outside of the hive, bring it in and drop it onto the bees that are fanning and it just kind of like the AC um, for the hive. So it will keep the, the hive cool. During the winter months, it will, the bees will cluster in order to stay warm. There are also some undertaker bees. So the undertaker bees are responsible for removing any um, dead bees or diseased brood from the hive. And they do that just to prevent any type of health threat uh, to the colony. The scout bees are, um, they're the ones that go out and search for any nectar, anything that's needed for the hive. They're the ones out scouting and come back, return and relay the message to the other bees of you know the information of there's nectar over here or we have found a new home, so this is where we're going. Um, guard bees. Guard bees, um, they're kind, it's kind of the last task before they become the forager bees. Um, they are the ones responsible for checking every bee that enters the hive, making sure that they have that familiar scent and belong in that hive. And then last but not least, the forager bees. They are the ones that forage for one of four things, pollen, nectar, water, and the uh, propolis. Um, it's one of the most dangerous jobs that the bees have. Um, they, this is kind of like the final phase in the life of a bee because they will pretty much work themselves to death. 
Okay, so the drones, we're gonna talk about drones. They are the male bees in the hive. They make up about several hundred. Um, their only job is to mate with the new queens and they have a lifespan of about 12 weeks. They actually will get removed from the hive during the fall season as they are no longer needed at that point. Yep, they get kicked out, sad, sad, sad. <laughs> Okay, so it's just a short video, just recapping what we talked about. The honeybee is one of the most collaborative insects in the world. Each hive is comprised of thousands of bees working together in order to build and sustain a colony. Within the colony, each bee has a specific role to play, a job. These are jobs like foraging for food, tending to young larvae, and building a honey. But with a brain about the size of a sesame seed, Makes the question, how do bees know what specific job they need to do in order to keep balance in the hive? The answer is written into the genetic makeup of each bee. And it starts with the queen bee, who has the unique ability to designate the sex of her children, which plays a pivotal role in their future. If the queen wants to lay a female egg, she will fertilize the egg by releasing spermatozoa that is stored in the spermatica, which sits behind her ovary. The spermatica is filled during her first week of life when she mates with up to 20 drones or male bees. If the queen wants to lay a male egg, she will not release any spermatozoa as the egg is in the ovary. And drones have a singular job. That job is to mate with queens from other colonies to propagate the species. When they're not trying to mate, they eat leisurely from the honey reserves and wait for a queen to go on her nuptial flight. Female bees, or worker bees, literally everything else. They keep themselves clean, care for the larvae, build cells, tend to the queen, store honey, forage, pollinate, guard the nest, and even feed male bees honey if they're begging for it. Each bee knows what to do because their hormones activate the part of their genetic makeup that tells them what jobs they have to tackle and when they have to tackle them. So to wrap it up here, we're going to talk a little bit about attracting bees and kind of things that you guys can do in your own backyard, uh, whether that's providing a habitat or uh, bringing in some type of flowers to your garden. Now, um, you, there's some, one of the easiest things that you could do to bring in uh, native bees would really just kind of have a ground nesting area for them. And grounds may vary really according to the bee. Um, some bees kind of like hard pack soil, whereas some may prefer loose, bare, and some might even want a little bit of a combination. Um, something that uh, is a, a quick one, if you do have garden pathways, um, sometimes you'll see items like this, and that's a telltale sign that you may have actually uh, a ground bee, so a ground nest. So this is something that we leave alone. And from my research, I, I learned that a lot of times we'll see this and we'll be fearful of it, like, oh, something's going to fly at it and it's going to get me. Um, actually, no, the, the, odd, the odds that that thing will see you are pretty low. Um, if you want to actually make your own, you could uh, do a, dig a, a sand pit. And it'd be about a two-foot hole, um, two to three feet in diameter, and just fill that with well-drained soil, so that way they can uh, do their thing. Now, another thing that you could do, um, be bumblebee nests. I didn't want to bombard you with all the information here, because this is something definitely you could do a search online. But just to give you an idea, uh, or not so much an idea, but just things to keep in mind is use untreated wood. You, you never want chemicals. You never want anything, pesticides around uh, uh, these bees. And uh, something else I learned was to be patient. It, does, it may take up a year, up to a year for a bee to, to, to make her nest in there. Uh, another thing you can do, and you see these probably quite a bit, uh, but you could go with a bee block. Uh, again, let's go with untreated wood on this. Um, drill a variety of size holes, and that could be from one fourth, uh, one fourth of an inch to half an inch, depending on the bee. And then uh, the, the depth is important, one and a half inches to three inches in depth. And of course, put that roof on there just to make sure we keep the rain out. And this is the interesting when I came across this was that they are also asking that you put it facing south or southeast. And that's actually something that we do with our honeybees. Our honeybees are always facing south or southeast because that morning sun is kind of what gets them up and, and moving. Uh, you can do a nest bundle. Um, always trying to upcycle. We're not trying necessarily to spend money on something that you could put together in your backyard. Um, instead of drilling, you could provide uh, just kind of pre-made tunnels in the twigs. And you can see this here. A bee would definitely settle in there. Uh, you could just tie bundles of hollow stems together. And just something to keep in mind is that they should be about six to nine inches in length, and one side should be closed just to kind of protect that bee in there. Uh, you can do pre-made houses. Of course, you can find all sorts of pre-made houses online. 
Um, but your gardens, gardens as far as like attracting that bee, I, I didn't want to give you just a, a ridiculous list of flowers because it, it really is, it's, it's a lot. Um, but I did want to, to give you the, the advice that contact your local nursery and, and replace any type of non-native plants with native plants. That's really, the, that's really what bees want. Um, it's as simple as that. So have those conversations with your local nursery, uh, your naturalist, or anybody that, that is, uh, is uh, educated in what, what's going to bring these bees in. Uh, visit gardens. Um, I'm going to make a big uh, a play for Heartburger Party. They have a beautiful garden out there. And you can learn just as when you're visiting, you can see like, oh, they're planting this and they're planting that. So I'm going to do the same thing when I get back to the house. Uh, also avo avoid chemicals. Choose a variety of flowers. Um, bees like different colors. They like different shapes. They like different sizes. Uh, plant flowers in clumps. And that's something that you see that they're doing at Heartburger Park. Uh, plant for divert different seasons. And of course, you can always provide like a shallow bee pond. And that's just something to give the bees a chance to kind of sip on some water. You could throw a couple of pebbles in there, just really, really shallow. So that way they're not drowning or hurting themselves. Um, this was kind of neat because we actually went out yesterday. We, we go to Heartburger Park quite a bit just for, for quick walks and runs. And I, I told Ann, it's like, hey, let's go by the demonstration garden and see if we can kind of find something. And sure enough, we did. We, we came across these three and, and we'll wrap up uh, the, the conversation here with a couple of videos here. But this is me zoomed in to this. And this is just with the good old iPhone. I'm not using anything major. But again, I noticed this too, how she's got those tattered wings because uh, she, she's an older bee. Let me just show you a little bit that we picked up yesterday. And of course, this is the honeybee. Now the next one. Now the next one should like should tell you right off the bat that bright metallic green. Uh, we were lucky enough to see uh, uh, a sweat bee, green sweat bee, yesterday as well. And when it, once I hit play, you can really kind of see the sheen on it. Ah, maybe not. Notice how quick this one is. That's that that was a uh, that was kind of interesting. Is is compared to that bump of uh, the honeybee that's not as quick, but that one just moves. I'll show it to you guys one more time. Not slow, just a quick kind of darting flight. And the last bee we saw just we saw, and we literally saw this in five minutes in the short time that we were walking through the garden. It's like, hey, look at this one, look at this one. And there was another like tiny bee, and I could I didn't want to bring I didn't want to put it on here and say, oh, that's a sweat bee. I wasn't too sure, but uh, it just moved too quick. But again, as the more you're out there, the the more you'll see, and then you'll at some point kind of capture some video. And this one, you gotta love the bumblebee. bee. She was busy. She was big. And you can just kind of see again, she's a lot like Andy being that she's real methodical and, she, and she's got a plan. Real pretty colors, very hairy, just a really pretty bee. Now, I can see that we're running a little short on time, so I'm gonna give it right back to you, Teresa. Um, if there's any questions, we'll definitely give a shot and see if we can answer them. And we uh, yes, at the moment awesome. we don't have any questions. If anybody has any questions, uh, please type them in the chat. Um, so how many, uh, when you were out at the Wildscape Garden yesterday and you saw these bees, what time of day was it? Do you have a... Yeah, it was actually late. We, I, we were like, let's just go kind of on a whim. Let's go check it out. And it was about 6.30, 6.40. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it was already later in the day. Um, most like as far as like again, we're we know a lot more about honeybees than we do about natives, but um, by that time, most honeybees are kind of they're kind of done for the day, so it's kind of neat to see at least one out there. Great, do you have a, a time that you recommend people to go be watching? Uh, I personally think in the mornings, like I would say about 10 a.m., because that's kind of when they're up and about, and uh, yeah, I would say kind of in the mornings around 10 a.m., 11 a.m., yeah, you'll, yeah, you'll see them throughout the day. Great. 
Well, it looks like we don't have any questions from our audience. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, and uh, anybody who's interested, y'all can email us at admin at philharbergerpark.org and we will send out the slides. And we will also be posting this video and the slides on our website next week. Um, and once again, we are, um, you know, a, a donation-based nonprofit. And so if you are um, looking for a way to support programs in the park, please consider becoming a member or donating um, at philharbergerpark.org. Thank you everyone so much. This was a wonderful talk and I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you guys. Thank you.